for this panel is uh, Tracy Skelton. Uh, Tracy is um, Associate Professor in the Department of uh, Geography at uh, this University National University of Singapore. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone and thanks very much for uh, the invitation um, to, to present here. Um, so I'm going to go straight into it uh, to use my full time. A digital citizen is defined simply as a person who develops the skills and knowledge to effectively use the internet and other digital, digital technology, especially in order to participate responsibly in social and civic activities. And this has become particularly linked to children and young people, as they are the generation growing up in a digital world, learning digital skills and utilising the internet in intense and sophisticated ways. In many Asian countries, the switch to digital communication and engagement has been rapid, efficient and accessible. And young people have been central to digital developments through their own skills and innovation, or through their consumption and desire for all things digital, as we're very clearly seeing um, so far in these papers. Common concerns around younger people and digital citizenship are that they are at risk and online, uh, unsafe online, or that they spend more time on meaningless digital activities than on social civic engagement or political participation, as just has been discussed as well. The ubiquity of the internet has raised questions about citizenship and whether digital natives are failing to connect with positive shared societal values and expectations. My presentation will engage with ideas about young people's political participation and the role the internet and, and social media platforms play. I explore two Asian-based examples of digital citizenship in Taiwan, the Sunflower Student Movement, and in South Korea, Ilbei, a right-wing male movement. In order to interrogate the complexities and tensions of positive and negative youth digital citizenship and political activism. But first I need to provide two contextual points. One is to say that I'm a geographer and I'm so not an expert in cultural studies or communications and new media, and certainly not digitally savvy, savvy nor competent. I don't use any social media at all. Um, but I do draw upon social media resources. In this paper I focus on young people's political engagements some of which link to the digital world with a blending of material and physical activism. Second to say is that while I've used the terms positive and negative as part of this title, what I'm really exploring are examples of hope, not hate. And this is inspired by the online, offline organization, Hope Not Hate, which I'm a member and support through financial and digital activities. Um, and you can see this definition. Yeah. So there's a definition there. So through an involvement with Hope Not Hate, I've become aware of the need to uncover and scrutinize the negative side of youth politics, particularly given my location in Asia, combined with forms of digital citizenship that are determinedly right-wing, fascistic, misogynistic, racist, ethnic-hating, ageist, homophobic. And this part of my research is very new and currently based on secondary resources. So in this presentation, I scrutinized two examples of youthful politics linked to digital citizenship in the East Asian countries of Taiwan and South Korea. While in both countries, the political activism had a national reach and impact, the loci of the capital of the, were the capital cities of Taipei and Seoul. I counterpose these two places in order to explore the complex and contested ways in which young people are practicing politics and citizenship, digitally and offline. In many cases, their activism is deeply connected with state discourses, neoliberal economic practices, and pushes towards particular formations of development, modernity, and democracy. Taiwan and South Korea share many political and economic similarities. They have experienced forms of military rule, endure political tensions and complexities with their closest neighbors. They have received substantive US economic investment, sustain a neoliberal economy concomitant with financial and business corruption, they share a history of struggles towards forms of democracy and have invested in particular formations of modernity, including extensive provision of education for their young people with extremely high enrollment rate, rates of tertiary education for students. Also very important in this context, both countries provide high quality, ubiquitous digital accessibility. My temporal focus is March to September 2014. The Taiwanese case analyzes the Sunflower Student Movement's pro-democracy resistance against a Taiwanese pro-Chinese government, and by extension, China itself. The South Korean case 
analyzes youthful politically motivated backlash, backlashes against grieving parents and their supporters, demanding state action and legal changes to deliver justice for victims and survivors of the Sewol ferry disaster that happened on the 16th of April 2014. Digital activism played an important role in both events. The authors, Kirsty Callio and Sarah Mills, draw our attention to the importance of human rights and citizenship. They focus on the ways in which there are significant, these are significant for children and young people at the same time as they are ambiguous in meaning, provision and access. They stress that, quote, young people's engagement in political communities varies notably as a range of interpretations of youthful citizenship exist in different geographic contexts. Geographies of youthful politics are always geographically contextual, and this includes practices of digital citizenship. However, I argue that while we can stress the importance of this spatial contextualization, we also have to be vigilant about despatialized youthful politics that can rise above geography and reach a global community that is largely degrounded and unbounded, notably collectives on social media. While politics and youthful activism are indeed geographically located, they can also transcend geography and become decontextualized. Young people across the world where social media is accessible are using digital for in complex and sophisticated ways, both to learn about politics, but also to practice them. So within um, young people's political geographies, we raise important issues about children's and young people's voices of dissent, their rejection of particular styles of participation, which is often tokenistic or comes with expectations of conformity and maintaining the status quo and the significance of forms of digital citizenship. Some, people, some versions of young people's resistances are framed as out of place and wrong, creating a wider moral landscape of appropriate and by extension inappropriate political conduct. Here I examine two cases of youth activism, one focused on hope, which we might interpret as positive citizenship, the second on hate, based on negative forms of citizenship. In both Taiwan and South Korea, young people were practicing political resistance, voicing their dissent and frustration, engaging in inappropriate political conduct, and yet are effectively at different ends of a complex political spectrum of aims, aspirations, and envisaged change. And I argue that it's important to be alert to the full range of youth politics so that we may pay attention to the politics of hate as we do those positive and hopeful youth practices. I stress that vigilance around all forms of youthful politics, is, including digital citizenship, is important. It is not all positive, forward-looking, inclusive, and egalitarian. Despite the predominant international discourses of things like youth as future, youth as hope of the world, the value of the 1.8 billion, age zero to 24, the UN Economic um, and Social Council presumption of positive youthful citizenship, quote, Young people are the centre of the future development agenda and its implementation, but also, quote, realising the future they want. These utopian aspirations for the future of a better world beg the question, what about youthful aspirations towards dystopian, negative and iniquitous futures? As I've argued elsewhere, political um, and geopolitical scholarship demands a careful and meticulous examination of what constitutes political agency among children and young people and questions the possible taking for grantedness of the value of political agency. Acknowledging that young people's agency is part of a political project, we have to ask what kinds of agency is deemed acceptable and what are the power relations linked to such notions of acceptability. We have to examine all the tools that young people access, especially social media. We have to ask what kind of youthful politics are taking place, what types of activities and activism we pay attention to what kind of interventions or challenges might be necessary. We need to locate these examinations within their geographical and geopolitical settings because useful political practices are inevitably bound up with nation state governments and legislative contexts. As mentioned above, Taiwan and South Korea have been ruled by military and non-democratic governments. Both have struggled to achieve democracy, but the, few, but the nature of the contemporary political regimes in each country have evolved in quite different ways. And this has a direct impact on the formations of youthful politics, and this in turn leads to the complexities of digital citizenship and activism. So my first case study is located in Taiwan and considers the emergence and activism of predominantly young people from across the nation, but congregating in Taipei in the form of the Sunflower Student Movement. 
In an interesting youth movement collective started, uh, sorry, in 2014, an interesting youth movement collective started um, small P and big P political action and resistance in Taiwan. Their protest was against the way a major trade agreement, the Frustrates Service Trade Agreement with China, the CSSTA, proposed between China and Taiwan, was being non-democratically pushed through the Taiwanese legislature. The youth movement became known as the Sunflower Student Movement and challenged national political processes and created a geopolitical rebuff to Taiwan's extremely um, powerful, exceptionally powerful neighbor, China, through peaceful and protest, protest activism. Young people acted within a coalition of students and civic groups and challenged legislative processes verbally, physically, and spatially, and achieved some success. SSM made extensive use of digital technologies to rally people to join street sit-downs and marches, to coordinate different activities, and to get their message out to the wider community of Taiwan. The SSM movement led non-violent protests in politically significant public spaces, and later occupied the legislative yuan. Taiwan's legislative chamber for, the, for 24 days, from March 18 to April 10. Their occupation was digitally recorded and live streaming was sent out by committees from inside the one. This included political songs that they wrote and recorded, and then were circulated particularly through YouTube. The actions of this youth, youth activism reverberate in the current state of Taiwan and build upon a genealogy of Taiwanese student movements and their embeddedness in historical, political, economic, social, and cultural society. Youthful, peaceful, peaceful process and struggle emerge within a context of challenging military state, uh, of a, sorry, of challenging a military state through to civic democracy practices, more recently including digital citizenship and more ambitious goals of ultimate freedom to be an independent nation. So that genealogy of Taiwanese activism is interesting about the techniques and, and strategies that were used. And of course, digital citizenship is, is one of the latest that has been um, uh, utilized. So turning to South Korea, I draw upon an articulate but disturbing essay by jo, Johan Tuan, uh, sorry, Johan Hojuan, um, and materials from the internet to examine political action taken by a collective of young men against an older generation. The South Korean case analyzes youthfully politically motivated backlashes against grieving parents and their supporters, demanding state action and legal changes to deliver social justice for victims and survivors of the Sewol ferry disaster. Of the 476 passengers, 325 were secondary school students. Only 75 of those 325 survived, and this was because they disobeyed the instructions from the ferry staff to remain in their cabins. Children and other passengers were using their mobile phones to communicate with their families as the ferry was rapidly sinking. There were extraordinary examples of ineptitude, negligence, and corruption on the part of the Coast Guard. They received calls from mobile phones but failed to act swiftly. The ship's owner, the crew, and politicians. In despair and anger, grieving families collectively began to protest through a vigil in Seoul, downtown plaza in May 2014, a month after the sinking of the ferry. Drawing upon more traditional protest actions, they demonstrated and marched. They camped out in front of the Blue House, the president's home, for 76 days, but the president refused to meet them. The protest then moved to Kwa Guang Guanam Square, an open square in the administrative area of government buildings in Seoul. The media, dominated by a corrupt and right-wing leaning government, decided to only partially cover the demonstration, demonstrations and instead began a discourse of resentment delivered in print, visual media, and digitally online against the parents for their excessive demands on the state and arguing that the parents should accept what happened and move on with their lives. Different forms of online and offline abuse were directed at the protesting parents by other parents' groups. However, one of the most visibly disturbing incidents that took place on the 6th of September in 2014 Grieving activist parents had become a, began a hunger strike on 17th of July and were continuing with it as they remained in their camps in the square. The group of young men connected with one of the largest South Korean far-right online com communities held a 100 pizza party, singing, dancing and gorging on food in front of the fasting families. Their exaggerated performances of devouring food <coughs> served as political activism and hate. But this was but one form of political resistance. 
of this youthful male group that promotes hatred, hatred against social minorities, women, people of certain districts associated with politicians who resisted previous military regimes, and foreign migrant workers. So this quotation is, is a Korean into English translation from Hankook Ilbo, an online news platform about Ilbe. Ilbe members have caused many problems online due to irrational articles that attack the homeless weak um, and those from the Honham region, women, and label anyone criticizing current policies as Yongpuk, um, which translates to North Korean sympathizers or apologists. These kinds of Ilbe members are showing signs of having evolved into extreme conservatives off and online, calling each other beng, heng, be, heng gay, a slang word that simply means active, active presumably on the Ilbe side. One Ilbe member posted on an, an article saying, we haven't been as active as progressives, but I'm now impressed that we can show off our Ilbe collective power from now on. And this one, um, Inside Il Bay, How South Korea's Angry Young Men Formed a Power uh, New Alt-Right Movement, um, is taken from 2017. Il Bay users are the kind of people who refer to Korean women as kimchi bitches. They call Chinese people, people cockroaches and homosexual men gay bastards. Excuse the language. They're the trolls who binge ate pizza to taunt fasting parents, or the ones who deface memorial park posters for the victims. They're known for deep-seated misogyny and a hatred of immigrants and sexual minorities, and they're waging an online war on the political left, a group they simply they call simply commies. Welcome to the site of Ilbe Storehouse, better known as just Ilbe, the hub for South Korea's new far-right movement. It has risen to, prominence, risen to prominence in the backdrop of South Korea's turbulent recent history, deep political divides, a youth unemployment crisis, and a backlash against liberal social values. So I think that provides a, a brief insight into this substantive online group who are practicing similar digital citizenship to the, social, social, uh, the Sunflower student movement in Taiwan, but with completely different goals, moral codes, and aspirations. They define themselves in relation to others who they denigrate and abuse. And initially this began online, but since 2014, online and offline male youth, youthful activism of hate has blended together over particular events. So I'm just going to close here. Um, I close with a comment on political symbolic imagery and imaginaries, and the ways in which young people are politically active online, um, but are also importantly offline, as their actions and capacities to work towards change, whether that's positive or negative. In Taiwan, a florist delivered over a thousand sunflowers to activists, and protesters wore yellow headbands with political slogans inked into them. Sunflowers are heliotropic and symbolic of a sign of hope. And these images circulated on mainstream and social media show dramatic, bright, symbolic yellow everywhere. Here was liveliness, color, cheerfulness, flowers, indetermined, united, and peaceful, even though trespassing protests and aspirations of hope. In South Korea, desperate families who lost their children use their bodies in a governmental political space as signifiers of grief, fasting, and determination to have justice and security for the nation and safety of the children. Yet they were directly challenged, denigrated and goaded, online and directly by young Ilbe men, stuffing their faces with pizza, littering the square with food, and shouting viciously. Their imagery, therefore, is a greedy gobbling and an aspirational imagery of male South Korean supremacy. We cannot and must not ignore or neglect to investigate such political activisms of hate. <laughs>